The Dominant Nine. Aside from being the nickname I gave to the years it took me to finish college, it's also a very important chord that should be in every guitar player's vocabulary. So we're gonna learn how to play them and maybe where to play them and how they can be used in a progression, right? So first of all, a dominant nine chord, the chord spelling for that is a one, a three, a five, a flat seven, and a nine, right? So uh, basically what that means is we take the major scale, we take the one, three, five, flat seven, which those four notes make a dominant seven chord, and we're gonna add the ninth, right? So the example we're gonna use is gonna be in the key of G. So the notes of G are G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. So to make a G dominant seven, we have the one, the three, the five, and instead of having the seven, which is the F sharp, we're gonna flatten it to make it an F, right? So we have a G, a B, a D, an F, and then we have to add a nine. So really, once we go around, the nine is actually the same thing as the two, except it's higher, right? So an A. So a G, a B, a D, an F, and an A. In G, make a G dominant nine, right? Now, where you use a dominant nine chord is actually never on the one chord if you're sticking by the rules, right? So it occurs on the five. So if we stay in the key of G, this is actually the fives chord. And in the key of G, G, A, B, C, D, D is the fifth note, right? So if we take all the notes from the key of G and apply them to the D rooted chord, we end up getting a D dominant nine. Now the voicing we're gonna use right now is gonna look like this. We're gonna do kind of two of the same thing, right? So I would say maybe the most common dominant nine voicing you'll see looks like this. I've got my middle finger on 5A, my pointer finger on 4D, my ring finger on 5G, and my pinky on 5B, right? So uh, as we just talked about, a dominant nine chord actually has five distinctly separate notes, and this only has four, right? So uh, with this voicing, we're actually implying the five. We have the one, the three, the flat seven, and the nine but we don't have a five, so we're implying the fifth note in this chord. Now, what we can do pretty easily, semi-easily, is add the five right here. So what I'm doing now is I'm barring the bottom three strings to get actually the one, the three, the flat seven, the nine, and the five all in one progression. So I have a very kind of complex chord. There's a lot going on in a tight voicing, but I do think in most cases it's worth getting your ring finger barred down like that to add the five into the chord, right? Where do we use this chord in a progression, right? Now, we, we could just replace any chord where you see the five. So a uh, regular progression in G, let's do a one, six, four, five progression. So this is G major, E minor, C major, D major, right? So if we were to strum it, one, six, four, five. Now, uh, you'll notice playing the five chord is always gonna kind of beg for some resolution back to the one. Now, the thing that makes these chords dominant is that it's gonna be requiring more resolution. It makes it a little more tense, right? That's why the dominant seven is a very blues, a bluesy chord, right? So if we have a G to a E to a C to a dominant seven, you can't really leave it there. There's too much tension. You gotta release that with the one chord, right? Now we're gonna get a similar effect, but in a little bit of a different way if we take a dominant nine instead of a dominant seven, right? So let's do the other voicing. G, E, C. Now you might notice that it's kind of coming at it a little bit different way, right? So again, a seven, dominant seven, to its resolution, versus a dominant nine to its resolution. I would say, I mean, just in, in my personal opinion, maybe the dominant seven is a little more bluesy, whereas the dominant nine is a little more playful, kind of mellow, I suppose. And one of the reasons that it is mellow is if we look at this voicing again right here, and let's take the root away from here. So we just have the bottom four strings. This is actually a minor seven flat five or a half diminished chord, which I did a separate video on. If you wanna check that out, I'll link you to it. But that definitely is asking for the one chord to come around because this right here, if we have a dominant nine without the root note, we're getting a seven chord, the seventh chord in the scale, right? So this is actually an F sharp, half diminished, which just begs for that one chord to come save it. So it's really almost the same thing. It's kind of that minor seven flat five, half diminished chord is tucked inside of a dominant nine, right? 
Now, one other thing that I like to do sometimes is maybe taking a chord and changing it between being like the one and the five chord. So what I mean by that is if we took a nine chord, but we're starting on the one, right? So let's take an E and we take a E major nine, right? This has a major seven, not a flat seven. It sounds like this. Now, if we were to change that into a dominant nine, it sounds like that, right? So the one chord, the five chord. You can kind of go back and forth between these two. It's like a very mellow type, chill thing to do, you know? You know where this is going. Hey girl. Oh, what is this? These are just a couple chords I'm playing. Am I playing the one? Am I playing the five? I don't know. You have to come find out. But anyways, enough of that. I also wanna do a quick arpeggio of how you do this, right? So an arpeggio, just playing it one note at a time. Let's actually root it on a B. Let's do something different, right? So we have one, a major third, a five, a flat seven. So there's, there's a dominant seven arpeggio. Now let's add that nine. One, three, five, flat seven. Nine is right there, right? You can just go up a major third from that flat seven. But what I want to do is actually play the major third on the same string. So we're a little higher over here. So if we have the root, a major third on the same string is going to be a four fret reach right here. So one, major third, five, flat seven. So it kind of makes this symmetrical type, kind of like an X shape, right? We have now the arpeggio in order would be a one, three, five, flat, seven, nine. You can even kind of slide into the last one, like. So it just kind of shows you, like, if we if we kind of break it down, if we start on the third, we have these stacked minor thirds, which kind of gives it a little bit of that ambiguity, whatever you want to, however you want to describe it. To me, it's kind of hard to find a word to describe the dominant nine chord. But uh, anyways. I personally use them in my own playing and progressions almost as a replacement for dominant seven chords. I feel like the seven chord is not dominant enough, so I will always insert a nine chord whenever I see a seven chord in a lot of different cases and stuff like that, right? Now, you don't always have to use them just on the five chord. You could easily use them on the four chord too to kind of make it even that much more dominant. So if we had that like a similar progression, like a G to a C to a D, we could turn both the, this is a one, four, five progression. We could turn the four and the five into dominant nines. That would be like a G. Very bluesy thing that you can do with that, right? So really, it's not that difficult of a chord to add into your vocabulary. Feel free to try them out wherever. Again, most commonly you'll find them on the fifth degree of any scale. But there you go, dominant nine chords.